Assalamu alaikum and good evening. This is Witness and I'm your host, Katrina Hossein. All eyes once again, and this time on the Maldives, where the SARC Summit, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation Heads of State, are meeting. Now, of course, whenever a SARC summit is held, it is almost inevitable that on the sidelines of the summit, Pakistan and India tend to dominate the proceedings. And that's not just for regional summits, be it the Sharm El Sheikh Dam Summit, where once again, Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Gilani and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh dominated the headlines, be it United Nations summits, where India and Pakistan tend to take over what's going on. Perhaps the other SARC member countries have gotten quite used to the fact that Pakistan and India will dominate whatever is going on. However, this time round, there is a third player on the scene when you look at India and Pakistan relations. Well, this time round, it's been Bangladesh, which objected to the Un e European Union allowing trade concessions to Pakistan for one year because of the floods. Earlier, India had raised objections and then withdrawn those objections, and this time round, Bangladesh stepped up. Well, we don't know what happened, but what we can tell you is that Bangladeshi officials said that their Pakistani counterparts had unofficially raised that matter on the sidelines of the SARC summit. And they said that there had been some uh, discussion here. The Bangladesh Foreign Secretary, Mohammad Miraj ul said that I will check with Geneva. As far as I know, we are supposed to withdraw this complaint. And Islamabad, of course, said that Dhaka's objections to the beneficial import conditions was an accident. Hina Rabani Kar says, of course, we are very concerned about it. We have been conveyed by them that it was at best an accident. Accident. Hmm. Okay, we'll take their word for it. But what has Pakistan achieved at the SARC summit? What has India achieved? Prime Ministers Manmohan Singh and Yusuf Raza Gilani addressed the media and they reiterated the same old, same old. But what exactly does that mean? If nothing particularly moves, can we say that that is progress? Because progress was definitely made at Sharm El Sheikh, at least from the Pakistani perspective. The Indian media and the Indian government and the Indian politicians, however, were up in arms at what they said were tremendous concessions by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh to Pakistan. This time around, it seems like Dr. Manmohan Singh has held his ground and progress has been made in effect that they have decided to continue the dialogue process. All the cards that were on the table are still on the table and one of the issues that has come through, often discussed, rarely implemented, that there will be visa relaxations between Pakistan and India. Well, let's find out what this SARC summit really means for the Pakistan-India peace process, coming as it does on the backdrop of Pakistan granting the most favoured nation status to India. Well, apparently we have granted that status. There was some confusion about this issue prior to the departure of the Foreign Minister and the Prime Minister to the Maldives Islands where the SARC summit is being held. But Foreign Minister Hina Rabani Khar says it is going to go ahead. Allow me to introduce my guest here in the studio to put this all into perspective for us. My first guest today is Senator Tariq Azim, representing the Pakistan Muslim League. However, he does sit on the opposition benches. My second guest today is Ambassador Retired Tariq Fatmi, who is a political analyst. And my third guest today, Major General Retired Jamshed Ayaz, who is a defense and security analyst. And of course, they both, uh, Mr. Fatmi, Ambassador Fatmi and General Jamshed Ayaz, write for newspapers as well. Thank you all for joining me here today. And Senator Tariq, um, I say same old, same old. Uh, nothing major, no breakthrough, but then we didn't expect one anyway either, did we? Well, it was just a meeting. There's a routine meeting outside of the sidelines. The only thing that has uh, highlighted this meeting is the fact that you mentioned uh, about the Indian media's reaction, and especially coming from the BJP leadership, who call it a disaster. I mean, that was uh, totally uncalled for. Because after all, Manmohan Singh didn't say anything uh, uh, which was too uh, disturbing for even those, you know, who don't take Pakistan. For, it know. wasn't even as, as uh, strong as Sharm El Sheikh was. Absolutely and Mahali was the same. I mean, when Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Ghilani went for the cricket match exactly. in Mahali. So I just, I, just, uh, I just wait to see, you know, when Manmohan Singh returns home, uh, if he's going to have the same treatment as he was meted out, you know, when he returned from Sharm El Sheikh. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope the BJP reconsidered their position. Because they do put him on a spot, you know, when they do that, you know, and uh, if uh, it is all uh, what I hear and what I read in the press that, you know, the uh, body language and that master Ferrix, you know, they were very good. And what he said, let's turn a new chapter. And he was hoping that uh, next time around, you know, 
uh, things would be even better. So, I mean, things are looking up, and I think it's for the interest of both nations, you know, India and Pakistan both. You know, it is good if people are, do talk, and so long the talks go on, dialogue goes on. It obviously augurs well. And they uh, have committed that yeah. the dialogue process. And will uh, it seems sometimes, and especially if you speak to Indians, you know, they always think, you know, when they're doing a you know, dialogue with Pakistan, somehow it benefits Pakistan. They forget that it benefits both sides, you know. Of course, you know, war is no longer an option, so the only thing left to us was to sort out our problems, whether it's Kashmir, whether it's Sir Creek, Asiatian, or the water problems. It's through dialogue. And uh, I don't understand sometimes, you know, why they get so up, you know, ups, upset about but you know, I, when I, there's the talks going on. I suspect, I suspect uh, that the Indian media really paints itself into a corner by taking the South Block line and now they're finding it very hard to go back on that. But then that's my Indian colleagues across the border, Ambassador Fatmi. Really, the issue is that nothing major can really be expected unless there is a bilateral meet meeting between the two prime ministers where they would really... Uh, we could really expect something. This is, after all, the sidelines of the yeah. SARC summit, and there are issues larger than India-Pakistan. Um, okay, India and Pakistan don't want to believe there's anything bigger than that, but there are wider issues to SARC, aren't there? Yes, you are very right, Katrina. In fact, in your introductory remarks, you have summed up uh, the past histories of the SARC as well as its current dilemma. In fact, the other member states resent very much the fact mm -hmm. that the regional cooperation, the regional issues get totally sidelined and these two countries kind of not only uh, hawk the entire uh, limelight but also deprive whatever m small and inconsequential decisions that may have been taken place uh, in the context of the meeting of the uh, leaders, uh, which is very uh, sad and uh, extremely unfortunate. Now, as far as the India-Pakistan equation is concerned, there is a need to understand that in the India-Pakistan bilateral relationship, a huge player is not present and yet is deeply interested in what is taking place between Delhi and Islamabad. The Kashmiris? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> the United States. The United States? Yes. Okay, we're going to add them into the mix now. Yes, very much so. They have played a very important role in nudging both capitals towards mm. A, reducing the temper, temperature of their rhetoric and in actually looking at a small gestures that can be made by both capitals in order to at least present or portray that the normalization process is still healthy and is still breathing. The reason simply is, the reason simply is that the United States is now placing huge amounts on India's future role in the region. And therefore it is essential for India to shed itself of these small irritants, because as far as India is concerned, Pakistan is nothing more than a small irritant, and it is now a major league player, as the Americans call it, and especially after Secretary Clinton's visit to India and her uh, major speech in Madras, India is now being urged to play a role far larger than even Indian leaders had the ambitious to play. In fact, Secretary Clinton has stretched the geographical boundaries of India to turn it into a passive power as well. And therefore, the India-Pakistan dialogue... Why, why do you say that? How, how do you say that? These are exactly the words of Secretary Clinton. Okay. Where she said, we know you are not a passive power. We know it's a very ambitious role. But we are there to assist you to play a role in the Pacific. Quote, unquote. These okay. are exact words. Which, by the way, have been taken note of virtually by everyone who follows this politics in this region. And therefore, the, the, the United States is very... But I totally agree with Senator Azim, Tariq Azim. War is not an option. In fact, it would serve the interest of both countries and of the region if they were actually to bring certain substance to the normalization process. That's Why? critical. Why? Because the disputes are all at the doorstep of the Delhi leadership. They, have the, they are the ones who have to show initiative. They are the ones who have to show large-heartedness, if there, such a word can be used in interstate relationship. And they have to be moved from the status quo. They are the status quo power. We are the ones who are interested in nudging them towards finding some kind of an understanding 
to if not on Kashmir, at least on Sir Creek, at least on Siachen. So we have to wait and see whether Manmohan Singh's good wishes and desires can actually be translated, translated. in reality. General Jamshed, of course, this is a crucial point, isn't it? For decades, Pakistan has put Kashmir at the top of the list, said it's our core issue. We maintain the position that it is our core issue. But the very granting of MFN status to India, which India had granted to Pakistan, I believe, in 1996. Six. So Pakistan really took its time uh, returning that gesture. Um, can Pakistan start moving ahead on other fronts like Seachan, like Sir Creek, like so many other issues that are pending between the two countries. And if there's no movement on Kashmir, do you think any political leadership can sustain that? <coughs> Bismillah <coughs> Actually, you know, one is a pro problem when two experts have spoken before you. <laughs> and uh, in my case, I think this is a very big problem that I am having. But I am an optimistic person. And I've been saying for a long time now, the time has changed. And now India and Pakistan have to come together. Because, you know, this century is going to be the Asian century, as we say it. And India and Pakistan relations has been at odd all, all my life. So you can see what's happening in our case, where we are losing whatever we could have gained in these 60 years. Now, naturally, what they are saying is very wise, and I agree with them. But I think the main thing is the intentions. We have to see the intentions of both the countries and the leadership. They have to move forward and really talk to each other and say that now, from now on, we will try to have good relations. I'm not saying very friendly relations, but good relations, so that we can be neighbors and we can move forward. General Sahib, um, it is of course no secret that the current military establishment remains very India-centric, publicly declared very India-centric. Uh, do you think that the military is ready to make the grand shift mentally that uh, it has to make on this front, on this issue? I think, Katrina, you read my mind because I was going to talk about the military. Mm -hmm. My point is that we never had discussions between the militaries and between ISI and RAW. I think high time we start that because I know this business a little bit more than somebody else. So I think all the time you're thinking of putting each other's legs, hmm. pulling each other's legs. I think that should end now. The point is we have to move forward and we can only move forward if India and Pakistan start talking to each other. As you rightly said, and they also said, Talking is the most important thing and talk about everything and let's say we we'll talk about Kashmir also but we will not really uh, focus so much on only one issue. We want everything to move forward. Anything you can th think of, even these visas and immigration and what have you, you know, because there are a lot of these problems which can be solved. Like people have been saying, I've been saying, others have been saying that Sarkri was there to be solved. It was on the edge of being resolved. The, or, and similarly, the uh, Siachen. Siachen. And we did solve it. Only thing we, what we do is, we have photographs and good lunches and all that. I think for my whole life, I've seen that. But yeah. I think a time has come that without, uh, besides photographs, we have to have move forward. We need a tangible success, Senator. We need a tangible agreement on one thing. Otherwise, it's going to be the standard one step forward, two steps back. In this case, I would actually say it's been two steps forward, which is unique, mm. uh, interestingly. Uh, but this element, of course, I'd like to draw in. Uh, General Dushidaya says that it's time to now hold talks between the ISI and RAW, which is the Indian Intelligence Agency. Uh, do you think it's time that the military leadership of the two countries should also meet? Because I suspect India might be uncomfortable with that. I think I agree with the Ambassador Sahib that it, it is actually India is the one you know who have got uh, to actually take the initiative. 
they are the ones, you know, like he put it, you know, they are the ones the status quo power. Uh, all the issues that are at the present, you know, are um, hurting our relations are in India's hands, whether it's a, a water issue, whether the Kashmir issue, whether it's a Greek recession. The, all these things, you know, India has to make the first move. I mean, we have always said, you know, that we will follow and whatever we can do, we will. Uh, they've got only one thing in their mind all the time whenever you talk to them is terrorism, terrorism mm. and terrorism. That's all I've got to say. I suspect but, when they are talking about us they say we have only one thing on our minds as Kashmir 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 so maybe these are the two issues that need to be set aside well for exactly I mean, still you know we have to be cautiously optimistic that you know these talks will bring an end to uh, this uh, long drama and we will be talking in, in real sincerity uh, including of course you know talking military to military intelligence to intelligence. yes I mean let, let's just put uh, some you know thoughts on the table here we know that the Pakistan army has since its inception been geared towards the threat from India that is the entire resort, the Hitra, if you want to say it, for the Pakistan army. <laughs> but, Can they get over it? <laughs> no, no, but the thing is, we always, people always tell us we are India centric. But if you look at India, they will tell you that they are Pakistan centric. They are indeed. You know, I mean, I mean General, General Saab probably knows it. No, probably yeah. knows it better. But uh, I'm told that you know, seven of the India's ten commands are you know uh, laid facing out against Pakistan. facing Pakistan, and therefore you know it is wrong to say that it's only us. You yeah. know, it's India as well. It's both. Talking yeah. about army as well is uh, ironic today. Only today, you know, Omar Abdullah. He has said to, you know, the Indian army should withdraw from certain areas of Kashmir where right. they're not needed, you know, let's do a drawback. And what has happened? Indian, Indian army. army has taken him on. And now we are told that here, you know, the policies are made by the army, not the civilians. Here is an elected leader of Jammu and Kashmir. He's asking the army to withdraw and they're saying we're not going to do it. I mean, so, you know, okay. when the India, now, Indians talk about Pakistan, they have to look at their own yard as well. You know? yeah. <laughs> Ambassador Fatih, this is, of course, a tricky part. I mentioned Bangladesh and the issue with Bangladesh uh, right at the beginning of the program. I kind of curious because earlier Bangladesh blocked that whole thing which India had been blocking earlier. Now suspicious minds, and I'd have to say mine included in that one, uh, it would obviously say that okay Bangladesh was uh, told to do this by India. Uh, and is, is that uh, possible? Is that doable? Because Bangladesh has had ups and downs in its relationship with Pakistan depending on who's in government, Sheikh Hasina or Khaldasya. It's difficult to be totally certain. I know Bangladesh very well, having spent many, many years there. Uh, the, this particular government does bear a certain degree of grudge. Absolutely. And uh, it is not unlikely that the Bangladeshis may have felt that this was a, the time to give a signal to Pakistan why Pakistan had not directly approached you see there in that sense I consider it a failure a minor failure but it is never there. you see you cannot take any country for granted you saw what happened in New York this year a tiny little country made life miserable for Pakistan and the Pakistanis woke up at the very last minute and you know we are beating the drums of our victory in the Security hmm. Council view I don't know if you have followed it we barely managed by, it. One, by one vote or something yeah <laughs> you know that is tiny countries received 189 votes <laughs> we received barely enough for us to scrape through yeah. so Bangladesh should not have been taken into uh, you know taken for granted they should have been consulted they should have been told it's a one-time concession we this never lobby we never lobby in Bangladesh yeah. we have a colonial attitude towards yeah. Bangladesh it's wrong and therefore they did it now it's true that if our foreign minister mashallah she's such a charming lady mm -hmm. if she approaches a Bangladeshi counterpart maybe the Bangladeshis will say okay fine because they seem to be they seem to be now yeah. saying it's an accident yeah, yeah. but one more accidents point and I, foreign policy sir <laughs> <laughs> incidents we have heard but accidents, accidents is a new one <laughs> but maybe the two words have become synonymous <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it yeah another point I want to make is because you asked about Pakistan you see the Pakistani government is better placed today then is the Manmohan Singh government. Why? Because the Manmohan Singh is a prime minister who is now being already told that you are only keeping the seat warm because the prime minister designate is being prepared and groomed for their task and everyone knows who that person is. Right. Okay, number one. Number two, you have the main opposition party in India, the BJP, which is very upset with this approach. Here the opposition parties, especially the biggest opposition party, the Muslim League N, as well as the Muslim League Q, they are both supportive 
of the normalization, normalization process, process with India bearing some fruit. So in that sense, and from what I know, this is not my turf, it is his call, but I do know that the Pakistan army also now recognizes that a normalization process with India may be to the advantage, long term advantage of Pakistan. Absolutely. This is my I view from what I hear. From what you hear. Yeah. Okay, yes. it's time for me to, short, to take a short break, excuse me. When I return, this is the issue that we will focus on. What should the configuration of South Asia look like 20 years down the road? And I don't mean in a conspiracy theory orientation. I mean, can we actually look forward to having normal relations with our largest neighbor, India? Nobody is saying that we have to demilitarize, but surely we can be less unfriendly, or can we? There's some more after a short break. Please stay with us. And welcome back to Witness. We were talking, of course, about the potential future relationship between Pakistan and India. And I want, obviously, I said 20 years down the road because I want to be a bit speculative here. And Jan Jamshed, I want to bring this to you. Um, 20 years down the road, you know, ideally, what would we like to see? We'd like to see trade between the two countries. We'd like to see a fairly liberal visa regime, if not a visa on arrival, that kind of scenario. Uh, but that nobody is talking about a demilitarized border. I, I, I don't think that that's... Um, ever going to happen, at least in, in, not in my lifetime. But can we ever reach the point where we, where we would have that kind of liberal trade and less suspicion, I suppose? I think so. I think so. Why? Because I think in the long run, it is beneficial to Pakistan as well as India as well as to South Asia. Because we have been living in these clouds for a very long time. I think Pakistan will benefit in trade and other things and India will also so benefit. Yeah. yeah. So the point is the only thing that I said earlier also, it's the intentions. Because you were talking about 96, mm -hmm. the, when they gave us this uh, this thing and we didn't. But nothing happened. Yeah, because the trade imbalance continues between continue. the two countries. So you know there was no fun in it because they tariff and customs, so they didn't allow anything to happen. Meaning the intention was not good. So I think Manmohan Singh probably has now understood the point, and but he is not strong enough. The designate prime minister will have to put in his, uh, you know, heat to it, and only when the whole family. And I would also say, the BJP has to be taken down also, because otherwise BJP is so strong that nothing will happen. In case of Pakistan, as Fatmi Saab rightly brought out, that in our case everybody wants a good relations with India and not at the cost of uh, something else like you said a militarization but they want good relations with India as just like good neighbors so that we can have trade we can have other things also but military point of view will remain there we'll remain but there. the and only, I, only yeah. thing is I say as far as military concern you know we talk about intentions and capabilities we don't go on the intentions because intentions can change, but the capabilities, right? like you said, all the guns are facing towards Pakistan. Yeah. So, you know, it's just not all. But you see, I also look at it this way that, you know, France and Britain historically have, have been, had the most violent relationship, and yet they both continue to have standing armies. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're military free, yes, yes. but they have free access to each other, all of the European Union for that matter. Every country has an army. Nobody has said, okay, you know what, we're not going to have armies anymore. But they trade, they move around freely, uh, and it's about time South Asia caught up. Uh, Senator, I'm going to put this question to you, which is sort of interesting, because uh, the BJP is a factor. And when you were a minister uh, in the Musharraf government, the BJP was there. And uh, I would like to take you back to a couple of the highs and lows there. Uh, the Agra summit, a total low, a disaster, just all fell apart. Don't know what the BJP was thinking then. But then the famous 2004 April, I think, the cricket match, which went really well. Mm. Do you think the BJP is just using this as a way to push the opposition, Congress party, or are they really anti-Pakistan? It's difficult to say, you know, they, they, they have got two faces and it's difficult to read, you know, which face is the right face. Um, uh, I was with the Prime Minister, you know, at 
two meetings, you know, which we held with India. And uh, both meetings... The then Prime Minister, Shokat Aziz. Uh, uh, Shokat Aziz, you know, with the Manmohan Singh. And even then, you know, we were very forthcoming. For example, he said in order to create, you know, a good trade relations with India, let's start with the banks, you know. He said, okay, I'll just immediately after this meeting announce that we are going to, op you know, open up uh, your uh, banks in Pakistan and vice versa. Our open will this one. And we'll wait for the State Departments and the legalities to take their own time. To which, you know, Manmohan Singh said, well, okay, we will wait and wait, and, and this never happened. And both finance men, so, both, you know, they, they immediately both closed the ranks and they said, no, you know, we will have to wait. Then we talked about uh, cement. They needed cement badly. And uh, what happened? They said, okay, we'll import cement, but our people will go and inspect your factories first. I mean, I've never heard anything such thing like, you want to buy something, you say, I want to go and inspect the factories. And it took six months before the first letter of credit was opened. i just give you two examples. Yeah. And also, this is a misnomer when we say most favorite nation. Yeah. It is one of the most favorite nations, because once you are signatory on WTO, right. you are supposed to, you know, yeah. give other person, exactly. you know. So sometimes, you know, it is taken wrongly as if India is being given some special yeah, status. It's, it's, it's not under. really such a big And deal. it is in India's favor, because the, like you quite rightly mentioned, the trade is India's, uh, in India's favor. At last 2010 figures, 1.5 million trade, yeah. 1.2 yeah. in India, yeah, yeah. ours was only about 300 million. Yeah, so, you know, it's, 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 but we're still prepared to go ahead and do it, you know, but you know, non-tariff barriers have to come down. If you ask any Pakistani trader, they will tell you that they'll say, okay, you know, bring stuff in, but please go and get this NOC from so-and-so organization. Yeah. And it'll take them months, you know, if not years to get that. A visa regime is still the same as it was in all times. We still need to work out what other border, you know, from borders, you know, around the border, what other routes we do we need to adopt apart from WAGA. So there are many other things that need to be done. But nevertheless, we are prepared to do it. And I, quite rightly being point, pointed out that in Pakistan side, I hardly a single uh, major uh, political party which will oppose uh, normalization of relations with India. But that is not the case in India. India That's you will get, you know, exactly. India. And it's very tricky over there. But uh, Ambassador Fatmi, one of the things that really concerns me is that relations between Pakistan and India are literally balanced on a razor edge. Mm. Um, and that's so dangerous because all it takes is for 10 crazy, and I use that word very carefully, crazy men to bring relations crashing down as we saw in the Mumbai attacks. Now, I know that India alleges that Pakistan in some way as a state was behind them, so forth and so forth. But the point simply being that why does India and Pakistan, why do we continue to be held hostage to a group of people in whose interest it is that Pakistan and India never be friends? There are no simple answers. Why? Because of history being a heavy burden on the shoulders of both. There is deep mistrust and so even the most innocuous and harmless action on one side is misread by the other. Unfortunately, this is a syndrome that afflicts Pakistan everywhere. I want to tell you that after the New York incident with Shahzad, Faisal Faisal Shahzad yeah. this is exactly the sentence used by the Americans when speaking to us. They said, you have one more incident and this relationship is going to blow up. And that's crazy. It is that's crazy. crazy. It is crazy. You are very right that you are, we are permitting ourselves to become hostage to the crazy, as you rightly put, yeah, actions that's what I, of I say, people I the word crazy who, who, who may actually be wanting to destroy the relationship. Yeah. And it is why it is even more important that because of this kind of relationship, the dialogue <coughs> must be maintained, lines of communication must be kept open, and how much more beneficial it would be as General Saab said, if there was a constant communication between the heads of the two intelligence agencies, we have the DGMOs, DGMOs. and the hotlines and we mm. have the two foreign secretaries, but it needs to be strengthened, it needs to be institutionalized and the frequent meetings should take place so that a degree of personal rapport and understanding should also be created. Because a, you see, we all come from totally different backgrounds, the three of us, mm -hmm. but we all are more or less saying the same thing that A, it is important that India and Pakistan should learn to live as good neighbors and B, that any modicum of cooperation, whether it is on trade, whether it is on visa relaxation, is going to be welcomed by the overwhelming majority of people of in both people. countries. And yet we appear to remain prisoners of our own misgivings and doubts, which is terribly unfortunate. 
and if Manmohan Singh and uh, Mr. Gilani can make even a small headway, I am sure the people will give them credit. Yeah. The tricky part, of course, here, uh, to continue on just uh, literally the sentence that Ambassador Fatmi said, uh, in Sharm al-Sheikh, if you'll remember, Prime Minister Gilani, in the joint communique, had uh, a line in there saying that the India's, uh, well, I'm going to paraphrase this, but Balochistan was mentioned mm. and India's involvement in Balochistan mm. was mentioned. Uh, this time round, there is no joint communique. There was a mm. press conference, but no joint communique. I, I think that that was probably a smart strategy mm. here. But um, India has also been playing in our backyard, clearly. Definitely. You know, actually, this has been a problem. As he said, for history, you know, the history is uh, taking over here. And we are not realizing what we're losing in, in the bargain. You're right that they have been playing in our backyard, in Afghanistan also. And that's why I wanted to bring that up to you. In Afghanistan also, because, you know, we keep on saying, you know, we are trying to be very decent and very active in this. We are saying we will not interfere in Afghanistan. We will just let uh, be yeah, just. people decide. Uh, uh, yeah, that's. But some of the system that Indians have, they don't say things, but they they do all these things. Now we have, I think, the three of us probably have first hand knowledge that they are doing something in Baluchistan and Fatah. So we have to. I think I said we have to. The intentions have to change. If we start talking to each other, and as he rightly said, at all levels we have to talk. But important point is that the chief executive in India or Pakistan, they should themselves understand what is the, uh, what is the future like if they don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So I think it's too important for this, this uh, part of the world to go forward. Now, if we want to have stability in Afghanistan, We'll have to see India and Pakistan relations, you know, because there's so many things going on. I think important point is, as he also, he said that uh, when I said the ISI and draw, they have to be slightly more mature. Because if we have told them that you always be on the wrong side of the other country, that's what they will be. But some chief executive has to really come forward and say, no, the time has come where we will have to move forward. So and perhaps, have... I mean, I, I, my mind is obviously drifting off to po the post-Mumbai scenario yeah. where it was sort of mooted that the uh, Pakistan ISI chief would go to India and that, cre you know, sort of mm -hmm. blew up in our faces. But maybe a neutral venue. Yes. Maybe the two uh, you know, ISI and RAW chiefs can meet on the sidelines of an international summit would probably be a, a good place to start. You know, um, the, the saying that ISI chief should go there, that was very silly. That, that was It was as silly yeah. as saying, that uh, ISI should come under the interior ministry of <laughs> Rahman Malik. So, you know, I think we, we have to be very, very realistic. Clear. You know, yes. be careful and realistic in what we say. Well, we're going to take a short break over here, but when we return, the crucial issue. Earlier in the program, we talked about the fact that the Indian media is very hostile towards uh, any concessions given by the Indian leadership towards Pakistan. Well, the Pakistani media can also be equally hostile towards India. What do we need to do about that? We have, a, we have a former information minister sitting with us, so we will talk to him about that. But after a short break, please stay with us. And welcome back to Witness. Well, when we talk about changing hearts and minds, a lot of people in both India and Pakistan really don't have to have their hearts and minds change in that kind of way that perhaps the Soviet Union, the erstwhile Soviet Union and the United States had to deal with after the Cold War. After all, the majority of India, northern India at least, speaks the same language. Uh, they call it Hindi, we call it Urdu. Scripts are different, but the language is the same. Uh, Pakistanis watch all the Indian movies. Uh, Indians love Pakistani television plays, or they used to anyway. Um, and I can tell you one thing that Indians really love, at least Indian women, they love Pakistani fabrics. They love Pakistani lawn. There are so many things that we have in common when it comes to cuisine, culture, heritage, history. But, and here's a huge but, the media plays a huge role. Senator Tariq, um, you know, I've covered numerous Pakistan-India summits as well as, um, you know, these international summits of Pakistan and India meet. And I'm friends with a lot of Indian journalists and we will be chit-chatting, having a meal together. But the minute I go on air in one of their <laughs> programs or they come on air in one of the programs and we are like worse than the politicians, I think, when we're trying to scratch each other's eyes. Um, what, what's going I, on here? I think, you know, 
<laughs> please permit me to slightly disagree with you. Uh, we are more generous to them than they are to us. Yes, well. <laughs> I mean, we still, one of the major channels, you know, still runs Aman Ki Asha. Yes. I haven't seen that from the other side. Well, Times of India is doing it. I mean, Times point. of India, but Times, yeah. have you ever seen Times of India's channels in you know, Times Now, no, for example? No, it's just <laughs> I mean, you, you have to uh, just uh, see it to believe. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, I mean, India, I mean, we have got something like if you go to any hotel, anywhere, for, for the, maybe the first 40 channels will be Indian channels. They do not allow a single Pakistani not channel. Not even our there. entertainment channels. Nothing channels. at all. Nothing at all. Now, when you say that they are, uh, our common language understand, you know, one of my friends recently went to India. And he wrote, he said when he spoke in Urdu, somebody commented, oh, he does speak our language. We wonder where he learned that from. Hmm. I mean, that's the kind of understanding they have about us. About us. Because there's no. I mean, I think I give full marks to the Indians. They've been able to present their case and market their case much better than we have done. I mean, we just talked about what they're doing in Balochistan. We don't mention it. Why do we feel shy? Yeah. We know it. We have got hold of their equipment. We, we got, got hold of their guns and everything. It. And acknowledging it in Shamal Sheikh. Yeah. We have got people who have been taken from Balochistan via Kabul, taken to India to train and get back into Balochistan. You know, this has happened all over. We have got Sarabjit Singh, an Indian, who has admitted that he has done so many, you know, uh, uh, killed so many people, you know, in, in, uh, you know, blowing up, you know, a few bombs in Pakistan. He's serving a uh, life sentence, you know, I think I it's think on the death row. Death, penalty, death yeah. row. But we don't mention him. Colonel Prohit, he blows up, you know, a serving colonel, yeah. blows up some Jota Express. We seem to have forgotten about it. We don't remember the 62 Pakistanis died in there. Absolutely. 2,000 Muslims die in Gujarat. Gujarat. We hardly mention about that. I mean, so things go. If our Hafiz Said here makes a statement, India wants us to apologize. And it goes on and, and on and on. And on the if, channels if Bal Thakre says that they will not allow Pakistani players to come in to play a cricket match in Bombay, we seem to just take it for granted. Yeah. I mean, these are kind of things I think we need why to go. Why do we do that? Why I don't know. I'm like just that? still trying to understand why do we feel shy to present our own case to the public and to the world and tell them, look, but you know. It, yeah, you see, now, uh, okay, this is uh, a catch-22 almost, Ambassador Fatmi. One of the things is that I found the Indian media to be really South Block oriented. They are on foreign policy, not, not on domestic issues, but on foreign policy, particularly when it comes to Pakistan, they really tore the Indian External Affairs Ministry mm. line. But the Pakistani media doesn't. The Pakistan media tends to be very critical and very open. Um, but now here's the problem. If we continue to, and in fact, as uh, Senator Dar Kazi was saying, if we start raising the issues that are there, Samjhauta Express, Gujarat, okay, Gujarat was still uh, you know, in India, but Pakistani started Samjhauta Express. Uh, I have personally been under Indian shelling uh, up in Gultari. So yes, there are reasons for us to be very hostile, but do you think that hostility between the media um, you know, is, is helpful or, or what do we need to do to change attitudes? There are two ways of looking at it. Of course, what you have stated is right, but I'm still happy and I feel proud of the fact that notwithstanding the universal depiction of Pakistanis as bigoted, narrow-minded people, our media shows a far greater degree of tolerance and acceptance of the Indian point of view. By and large, yes. There yeah, are some exceptions. I have no problem with it. I would rather have that than that that every single media personality should be echoing the line presented by the Foreign Office. I would pray. Even though, let me tell you, it is also true in London and it is true in Washington, and sure. I have served in both capitals, uh, in Washington particularly, that the media on foreign policy issues generally takes the line given to it by the State Department. State the Department. New York Times will always echo whatever the State Department tells them to do. But I think that in the case of Pakistan and India, both sides now need to be a little more restrained in their expressions. Why? Yeah. Because the media has suddenly become a very powerful, powerful tool, tool yeah. which was not the case 10 years ago. Now sure. it is penetrating the hearts and minds in every single village and thana in both India and Pakistan, thanks to the electronic media. And what they do can either help the cause or hurt the cause. Right. And if we genuinely believe that eventually India and Pakistan have to learn to live as good neighbors, the media must also contribute to that process. Can it be done, General Jamshed? I'd like to say one thing before I say uh, answer your question. You know, I've been the president of the Institute of Regional Studies mm -hmm. for about eight, nine years. That's right. Where our job was to read the Indian media mm -hmm. and, you know, prepare something. And we used to send out many things 
for these diplomats and ambassadors and senators. Now believe me, in the Indian press, what to talk about some Jota Express and other things, they will never even talk about the insurgency they are having in their backyards, in Assam and whatever you. Nagaland and Nagaland and Mizram. seven sisters. So, you know, they have their restrictions. It's not like Pakistan. Because Pakistan, I've seen, they just say whatever they want to say. It depends on the publisher, it depends on the owner, I don't know who, or the editor. But Indian media, uh, we, I have analyzed this many times, sent researchers on this job, but they have found that nothing anti-India, which will be called anti-India. Yeah, like against is, a state, against, against the anti-state. State, yeah. is, is there. You can see anything, and I've seen it not once, for, I've been for 10 years, so you can imagine that uh, my re reading would not be wrong. So I think uh, it's very difficult to tell How the media. How can we overcome this? Uh, do we think we need to meet Indian Pakistani journalists, need to meet at conferences more, have a, you know, uh, you know I don't know. I you mean, know, I, I think they meet a lot. Programs. Like you said quite they, rightly, when we do meet, you know, I mean, like you must yeah. have met your counterparts and we meet regularly. Well, you meet them, you know, everything is hunky-dory, yeah. fine, you know, but as soon as they get back to, across the border, no, you know, they have to But maybe we need to actually sit down and say, look, this has to stop. And not in a South Asian context. We maybe need to... As Ambassador you know, Fadmi said, India. perhaps, you know, we have to, you know, ask them and we should also t follow the same line, you know, that we should not have to tow. tow. Yeah. The journalists don't always have to tow the foreign office yeah. or the army line, you know, and we have to take an independent yeah. uh, line and tell the people the truth. Yeah, General Lipset, if you could quickly just uh, add for me, uh, you know, where, how did you access Indian papers? Through the internet uh, now, but how did yeah. you access them earlier? We used to buy the papers. You used to buy the papers, because that's uh, you know, so tricky. Uh, yeah, we used to buy the papers and have the cuttings and, you know, produce something. But now internet is there, yeah. so sometimes you have to pay for the internet. Right, because some of the sites are way yes. sites, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I've run out of time, so I'm going to leave it here, but this is an issue, of course, that we will return to over and over again. I'd like to thank my guest, Senator Tariq Azim, and Ambassador Tariq Fatmi, and Major General Retired Jamshed Ayaz. Thank you so much for having joined me here on a very important discussion. And ladies and gentlemen, the only thought I can, uh, that comes to me at this time as I wind up the program is one crucial issue. Pakistani and Indian channels should be free to air in each other's countries. We talk about cultural invasion, we talk about all these other issues, but let's face it, all those Indian movies and Indian television shows are available either in the DVD shops or wherever. By blocking them at the state level, it really is irrelevant. We shouldn't be doing it, but it should not be a one-way street. Pakistani news and entertainment channels should also be available across India. And that is what is going to bring the two countries closer together. They're going to hear different perspectives. They're going to hear different attitudes. You often go on the internet or I go on the internet. And the hostility that each other's people express sometimes on news stories, you know, we can only erode that by really just showing our channels there and them showing their channels here. We don't get any Indian news channels in Pakistan legally. And uh, you can only get them through satellite. And I suspect that's the same, the same is true in India. So let's hope that this time around, of course, the ministers of information are not there in the Maldives. But maybe this is an issue that needs to be taken up by media houses as well. And a Park India conference just involving the journalists perhaps should be on the anvil somewhere. For now, it's Katina Sen saying for the Hafiz from Islamabad.